Hello and welcome to the very first video in the Artist and Video Lecture Series. My name is Lydia Dildillion and I'm an Associate Lecturer here at UWGB and UWGB Marinette. Today I'm going to be introducing working artist Carlene Munez to my intermediate drawing class. Today she's going to be lecturing upon her work, studio practice, and how she comes up with her drawings. This lecture series is going to be one of many lectures brought to you by UWGB Lalton Gallery and UWGB Marinette Art Department. This collaborative effort in bringing these artists to you in this virtual platform will provide a great opportunity to introduce working artists across the United States to the wonderful community here at UWGB. Without further ado, let's go ahead and take you into the classroom to present Ms. Carly Munoz's work. All right, so to go ahead and start us off, I'm gonna go ahead and just briefly introduce um, Carly. Carleen Munoz is a Cuban-American artist born in Miami, Florida. She received her BFA in drawing from the New World School of Arts in 2006. She and she was awarded a graduate teaching assistantship in 2011 from the University of Florida, where she received her MFA in drawing in 2014. Currently, Carleen works as a adjunct drawing professor and instructor at the New World School of the Arts and Nova Southeast University. She teaches a myriad of wonderful 2D and drawing classes there. Uh, she is also formerly um, a Fountainhead Studio resident. Her drawings and paintings um, have been exhibited in both nationally and international galleries and museums, including the Frederick Snitzer Gallery, the MA Art Contemporaneo, and the Boca Raton Museum of Art. Most recently, um, Carlene has uh, exhibited her drawings and um, has been published in Unafraid magazine. So if you have uh, a chance to go pick up that magazine, you can also see her work there. Um, I think primarily um, I met Carlene or was introduced to Carlene at grad school. Uh, we both attended the um, University of Florida uh, grad school, the painting and drawing program there. And so we kind of started our art friendship, if you will, there. So um, it's been really wonderful to see her work grow um, as in grad school and then also too, just as we've kept touch over the years um, to see her kind of work grow. Um, and of course, I always kind of hate introducing artwork or giving a summary of artwork uh, when an artist is actually in nearby when I'm talking about their work, but I'm gonna do my best, so don't judge me, Carlene, if I, if I mess this up. Um, <laughs> but um, I think primarily uh, a great way to describe, I think, Carlene's work is looking at through the lens of abstraction. And I think too, when we think about abstraction, especially since modernism, that is a really wide field. It's a field that is really dynamic and has grown so much since the 20th century when it was first kind of formally created. Um, but I think that's a good way to start thinking about her work is this kind of abstract process. And more than that, it's not just um, this tool for her, but rather she uses the vehicle of abstraction to really hone in on kind of her own meditative process, this kind of existential exploration of presence that she has. Um, and I think it's deeply rooted in ritual process as a meditative process, as I said, and um, kind of undergoing this kind of spiritual relationship that she has, not only with drawing, but also just how she kind of functions in the world and trying to capture that presence of being um, each time she goes to draw. And I think that's the real beauty in her work specifically. It's, it's looking at the formal content of how the composition is designed, how she uses elements of art, principles of design, form, line, color, and value to really talk about some of these um, really ritualized drawing processes and to see this kind of impulse of this kind of higher meaning manifesting in these abstract creations. So um, that's going to be my brief little summary. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and just turn over the lecture to Carlene and welcome to class. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. That was amazing. <laughs> you, you cut off a bunch of things that, um, that I was going to mention, which, but I'm glad that you mentioned because um, it even like, you know, when you hear somebody talk about your work, I think it's great because um, you're hearing another perspective. And um, it also lets you know that you're communicating a lot of the ideas you want to communicate. Um, so I, I think it, it was great. Thank you for that. <laughs> so um, so like Lydia was saying, or, um, your professor, that I, I studied at New World School of the Arts. I got my bachelor's in drawing there. And then I went to UF and got an MFA in drawing. I've always been dedicated to drawing uh, pred predominantly. I have painted here and there, but drawing is something that really captivates me. I think the idea that um, when you're drawing, it captures your presence. 
and there's so much there with your own touch and the experience that you have with the paper, the way that it records your mark. That's something that's always really interest, interested in me. And also the fact that the fragility of paper is something that's always been important to me. This idea that I can work so long for hours on this, just this piece of paper and that I could lose it. Um, so working on that, that commitment that it takes for me to take care of the paper, like nurture the paper, work on it and, and preserve it really for me is, is like a spiritual, like a special moment. Um, so that's one, one of the reasons you're going to see a lot of my work, um, you know, on paper. I'm going to share now my screen with you so we can go through a few of my drawings as I talk. So kind of, I wanted to start with my earlier work just so that you get an idea of how my work has evolved and how it's changed over time. The things that I've been thinking about, the things that I was working on, what led me to where I am now. So um, this drawing that you're looking at, um, I did right before I went into the University of Florida. So between my bachelor's and my MFA. And I was creating these mindscapes so these places, they weren't specific places, um, just these places that were in my mind. Um, I've always been interested in, in landscape and space and the way that nature can be beautiful, but also very tumultuous and, and dangerous at times. And uh, I wanted to capture that, that essence of that, of how you can be you know, capture that wonder that you have in nature and feel secure and, and, and kind of comforted, but at the same time, you're a little weary and capture some of that darkness that, that nature can, can have at times. Back to, you know, where I started. So you can see the landscape there. It's a mindscape, not a specific place like I was talking about and kind of just capturing that duality of a place that is, um, you know, you know, maybe a retreat, but at the same time can be, can be quite, you could be eerie of, about being there. Um, these drawings I created using pen and watercolor. So the background is watercolor and the, the drawing that you're seeing, the black areas and the gray areas are all pen, not pencil. So it was a felt tip pen. I would have like various different ones. Some had more ink than others. And I would just layer my marks. Similar to the way you work when you're stippling, but also just varied marks to create these kind of um, growths. Then at UF, I started to work, I continued to work on the landscape. Um, and I think slowly you'll start to see how I, I began to abstract uh, the space even more. Um, but again, this is watercolor with pen again. And here's another landscape. And then I just want to give you an idea of how, you know, I went from describing specific places or uh, landscapes, working a little bit more traditionally, to then uh, working to more abstract imagery. So from there, I thought a lot about why I was creating landscapes and what intrigued me about landscapes. And uh, what, aside from the fact of that landscapes can be in a place that you can feel comforted in, or these phenomenons, you know, natural destructions can happen. I started to, to read um, Poetics of Space. And this, this book talked a lot about how we perceive spaces, large spaces, like open spaces, very small spaces, and that some of us might be comforted, some of us, um, it might drop certain memories. And just dealing with space, I started to abstract my, my the way, the places that I was drawing. So with this drawing, you'll see I worked more in an aerial view where you're looking down onto what I considered like an island. And then my work started to become more where I'm capturing the essence of things that are found in nature, patterns, um, very inspired by nebulas, very inspired by all the patterns that you could see in nature. Um, and I started to just take the essence of what I feel that I see in nature and create these just very abstract environments. So breaking the boundaries of traditional landscape into more of these, like, I, I call them like these dark matter, unseen matter. 
And here's a close up. And these drawings, I started to do them using color pencil on paper. There are times you'll see that I might write graphite. Um, sometimes I do incorporate some silver watercolor, a few mixed mediums, but for the most part, a lot of the imagery is built up using color pencil. And the way I work on these is I, I never plan a composition ever. I don't, I never know what it's going to look like in the end. I start by layering marks and I work very intuitively. So I let, once I lay down marks, I start to respond to those marks and I start to see things, things that maybe my unconscious starts to, to unravel. And from there I respond. And it's just this back and forth of Larry Mark seeing things, uncovering those things. So it's very much like I'm scavenging off of the paper, you know? I'm I'm responding to the process of drawing on this surface and, and slowly the surface starts to reveal things to me. And I've always worked in this way predominantly. It's just something that I enjoy. Um I enjoy not planning my composition. I I enjoy seeing what happens in the end and that surprise that that um that I get when I'm done with a drawing to me is is very insightful uh, many times I look back at the drawing and it's almost like I learn from it and I see things that 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 maybe I wasn't aware of that were you know things that maybe my subconscious is trying to to discuss I did also a series of drawings. Um, you'll see some of them are named Moon, Silver Moons, um, for a recent show that was in uh, West Palm. So you, you will see here in some of these that I'll have these images that are uh, resemble moons or resemble things that are a little bit more um, like things that you'd find in outer space. But I try never to force an image within my drawing. Um, circles are something that appear when I'm drawing and creating marks. Also, the ribbons that you see or the things that look like root systems or trees, those appear just from uh, the marks that I create. I start to see them emerge. Um, also started to notice that these like pyramid-like images were, were appearing. Um, perhaps the way that I scattered my marks uh, creates that. Um, but all the things really do happen intuitively, and then I respond to that. Um, this was a work that I cut into the paper and layered it. All the silver that you see in the drawings is uh, silver watercolor. Drawing, you'll see that there's a small grid that appears. That's a reference of where I'm, I'm talking about format. I'm talking about the meditative process of, of drawing, creating a grid. Um, and that is a little reference there to an artist that I, I really like, Agnes Martin. And there'll also be another, there's another grid. If you look closely, you'll find integrated there. Now we're getting to like a lot more recent drawings. Um, I've drawn a lot during this quarantine. So um, I've taken advantage before classes started to just work. And I did a, a, a several works um, and some of them are featured here. And uh, I just used that time as, as much as I could and, and placed any of the anxiety or any doubt that I was having about what was going on into my work. Um, and I think some of my favorite drawings have, you know, happened during that time. And I, I really always promote that. Like anytime you're very, you know, you're dealing with something hard, you're stressed. I always say work, draw some of your best work will be created in that time. Um, here, this is another recent work. I'm, I'm starting to think about the more of the surface of the paper and then integrating the paper as one of the materials in that, in the sense that you'll see how it's almost like the paper appears torn or appears that it's it's kind of you know tattered and and within the the landscape or this this environment.
I work a lot with negative space. You know, I'm sure you all noticed where a lot of the, the images, um, when I'm working with the patterns, I work within the negative space and I allow the positive space to shape a lot of that imagery that you're seeing. And this is the most, very most recent drawing that I did um, called Fixation. So again, I'm working with uh, incorporating the paper, making it seem like these abstractions are flowing outside of the paper. To me, it's also a reference to Lucio Fontana when he cuts into the canvas. So admitting that this is a drawing, you know, um, but still playing with these like abstractions and, and working intuitively. And then some of the artists that I'm inspired by is uh, Ithil Cahoon is one, and she was part of the British Surrealist group. She created a lot of um, these hallucinatory landscapes that were inspired by the metaphysical world. Uh, she experimented with automatism to find images uh, within the subconscious, which would then be developed or interpreted if desired through a more conscious means. So I feel like that's a lot like the way that I work. And I hadn't known about her work when I started to work the way that I did. And reading about a lot of artists that use this kind of automatic process was really um, kind of revealing for me. It helped me feel like I wasn't alone, you know, uh, that other people perhaps through the process of drawing discovered this, this kind of a process, this way of expressing themselves and, and in a way connecting more with myself because I feel that when I do work intuitively, I'm, I'm finding out things about myself or I, I'm learning about my existence. I'm learning about the world in, around me. I'm, I'm going into these like meditative states and, and, and the ritual of drawing does, does really um, kind of enlighten me. Uh, another artist is Lee Bonicu, and she creates a lot of sculptures. When you look up her work, you're going to see a lot of sculptures, but um, she also has a lot of drawings and paintings, and I'm very much inspired by her drawings. Um, some of them she created uh, using soot, which is pretty much a fancy word for charcoal. <laughs> But um, her drawings are really, really beautiful, and I do recommend you looking at them. But I put a quote here um, that I feel like also captures a lot of the, the things that I'm thinking about when I'm working. Um, she says, the natural world and its visual wonders and horrors, man-made devices with their mind-boggling engineering feats and destructive abominations, elusive human nature and its multiple ramifications from the sublime to the unbelievable abhorrences to me are all one. So that idea, like I was saying that, you know, the natural worlds can be wondrous, but it can also be, you know, tumultuous and um, also the way that man has affected nature. So I feel like that, that quote was uh, resonated a lot with me and I wanted to share that with you. And then all the artists that are, I'm very inspired by her, Via Selmans, you know, William Turner and Agnes Martin. And um, there are many more, but those are just a few I wanted to share in case you're interested and you want to look back at these artists. I do recommend them. I think that they're great. Um, and now I want to share with you just uh, my practice. So I draw a lot. I'm drawing all the time. I'm, I am one of these people I've been drawing since I was really young a kid and I would always haul around like a notepad my dad would have all these like yellow legal pads around and I'd always grab them and draw in them and um even till today I have sketchbooks in my purse sketchbooks in my pocket um I carry around little sketchbooks with me everywhere um anytime I'm waiting I bring out my sketchbook and I draw um it's kind of like Lydia was saying for me it is a very meditative process it grounds me um, so it's something that just helps me be in tune with myself. And, um, so I wanted to share some of the drawings that I do in my sketchbook. Um, I'm a firm believer that draw when you can. So I have some of these sketch, little sketchbooks on my nightstand. I have them by my couch. Uh, like I told you in my bag, I have several of them. Um, I just carry around with me and, and I work in the same way in them very, very intuitively. And I'm always surprised at what the composition ends up being. And I also wanted to show, share with you that now that we've been, you know, dealing with the virus and, you know, we've been quarantined and 
all that. I've been in my at home, you know, my own little studio. So I've been working from this small desk. I also have like an easel that I'll set up behind me. And here's a little close up so you get an idea. So I work in a small space. Um, when I work on large drawings, I pin them to the wall. And then I work on like a roll of paper pinned to the wall. Um, and then I want to show you something that I share with all my students. When I'm not on my desk and I'm not working, you know, on a large drawing, I set up this little table next to my couch. Um, anytime there's a commercial, anytime that I'm just hanging out, I have my sketchbooks there in those drawers. I have more art materials. So I'm always drawing. Um, and uh, this is something I share with my students because many of them work, have, you know, jobs aside from school. And they always tell me, you know, well, professor, I never have time to, to draw. And I, one of the things I tell them is set up a little table next to your couch. And when you're relaxing, you know, and a commercial comes up, just bring out your sketchbook, draw for a little bit. And um, you'll see that it's really inspiring. And sometimes those little drawings become special. And sometimes they inspire a larger work. So I'm, I'm a firm believer of drawing as much as you can whenever you can, like I said earlier, and placing these little workstations all over your house. Uh, I also have a little workstation on my, by my bed on my nightstand. I didn't take a picture of that. But um, I thought that, you know, this is important to share because, you know, when you're an artist or when you like to draw, you know, I feel like you need to make it accessible. It needs to be part of your life, integrated like anything else. So if I have time to watch TV, I have time to draw. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, I have one question. Um, so in a lot of your work, you use those ribbon-like structures. Do you have like a meaning behind some of your figures that you use like those? Well, so... I wondered too why they came up because like I was saying that I work really intuitively. Um, it's something that I started to see emerge in a lot of the patterns that I was making. And then I started to notice, wait a second, you know, this from roots, I can also see these ribbons. And I started to just find these ribbons. The only thing that I can think about is, um, you know, my, my grandmothers, both of them uh, were seamstress and, um, also, my great grandfather was a tailor. So I think somewhere in there, maybe, you know, me seeing fabric so much um, in my life, uh, maybe that is, is in my subconscious somewhere. And I'm, and I'm seeing that, you know, within the, those patterns I'm making and I'm making them emerge. Um, but, but another thing about that is basically when I'm drawing in the way that I'm drawing is I, I wanted to get away from drawing the landscape traditionally. So instead of drawing trees, you know, the ocean, the water, you know, literally, I wanted to just capture the essence of it, um, the essence of what a nature does or what, how, how the landscape is. So a lot of times you'll see these ribbons or you'll see like um, these geometric forms as kind of like a stand-in for things that you find in nature. So the way they, those ribbons weave is very similar to the way, you know, the vines on a tree or the branches on a tree um, would grow. Thank you for your talk. I have a question. Yes. When you're drawing intuitively and you're drawing um, with the idea of nature and understanding that things are made up of things and smaller and yeah. smaller and bigger and bigger, how do you like hold back and not fill the picture plane? Like how do you um, keep things uh, quiet in areas so that it doesn't overwhelm the audience? That's a, that's a good question because um, oftentimes I have overwhelmed the paper um, or I have, like I was saying before, like um, overworked it. Um, so a lot of times what I'll do is um, to kind of prevent that is I'll work scatter. So I'll work in one area of the paper and I try not to spend too much time there. And then I draw my attention to a, another area of the paper and kind of just work scattered and then see where things start to connect. Um, and then also because I work a lot looking at negative space, like a lot, that's like a very big component in my work. Um, <clears throat> I start to see in that space between the patterns, right? Those clusters of patterns. I start to see areas that 
I, I could leave open. And then those open spaces become things on their own. So when we, if you think back at that drawing that I did Oculus, where it was like the circle within the circle, um, that circle just started to appear for me. So I made sure to, to let it go. But it's a delicate balance. Like I was saying, sometimes I go over. Um, and especially because I don't plan my compositions. You know, I don't say, okay, this is going to have a big circle in the middle. And, I, you know, I don't do that. Um, sometimes it, you know, I lose it. But that's kind of like what I like. <laughs> I like that idea. It's kind of like back to why I like paper. You know, I like this idea that, you know, maybe I, I lost that time. You know, I don't have that drawing, but, but the time that I drew is here, you know, it's, it's within me. I, I experienced it, but, um, you know, it didn't work out as like a, a formal drawing. But yeah, just the balance of, of working with that negative space, I try to draw my attention to little areas and then, you know, thinking about with those, you know, those spaces in between, how I could save them. But it's like preserving. I'm preserving. That's a good question. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I okay. All right. Um, I have like a double mute feature. <laughs> so, um, all right. Good. Uh, yeah, it's very good. <laughs> um, okay, so I have a I have a couple of questions. Um, yeah, I think it, it's good. It's going to go back to that kind of materiality of like your process of selecting papers. And now, granted, I haven't oh. seen one of your <laughs> your drawings yeah. in a while in person. Yes. So, yeah, um, right. Yeah. So, Thank so you. how do you, how do you how do you go about selecting papers since it is such a a delicate process for you because it is really almost a performative action like you are responding to the page and, and where you are presently in the moments so how do you choose yeah. paper and material so very good question and i'm glad you brought that up because you know when i'm thinking about what i'm going to talk to you all i can't think of everything at once you know um but that's a very big thing uh i'm glad you brought that up lydia so um you know when i'm working with paper um you know sometimes i work with very thin paper um, a lot of those most recent drawings, and I don't know why I do this to myself, but are super thin, thinner than ever. And I've had professors tell me, you know, work on something thicker, work on canvas. You don't have to worry about it getting destroyed. And I just, I'm, I love that discipline. I'm, I love that fear of that I could lose that paper. But uh, I know it's crazy, but it's just something that that I've always been into. Um, so the paper's super thin, and the reason I like it is. Um, so the different papers create different patterns. So when I'm drawing, let's say I'm drawing with a certain color pencil, um, depending on the surface of the paper and how much, you know, binders in there, uh, how thick or thin it is, the, the marks change. So sometimes the marks can be very crisp and you could see every line I've done. And other times it's almost like hazy, you know, where I'm just like kind of rubbing the, the surface a little bit and, and they get very, very light and I build it super slow. And I think some of the drawings, you could tell which ones those are, that they're very light. Um, so I select the paper by, you know, deciding what kind of marks I'm, I'm going to have. If they're very delicate and very light, you know, the paper's very thin. If I'm going to start to get darker in high contrast, you know, sometimes my paper's a little thicker. Um, I think the thickest paper I've ever used, and I haven't used it recently, is um, like a hot press watercolor paper. But the papers that I use now... Um, I, I use some handmade Japanese paper, like the Okawara that you saw I used in my MFA. Um, recently I'm using this paper. It's the cheap, it's cheap. Um, it's like a huge pad. It's this thick. Um, let me see if I can grab it really quick. It's super, super thin. It's, um, it's made for sketching. And of course, I'm trying to make it more permanent, but it, they come thick like this, see, so that you can create lots of sketches on it. But they're so, so thin, very thin. Um, it's made by Senelier. So it's, um, I think they call it Lamaxi. And they're in this square format, which I love. I've been working a lot with like the square format. Um, so you'll see that like, this is just something I'm playing around with right now but um yeah it's super thin and i have different sizes of it some are a lo lot larger and some are like really small but depending on what kind of imagery i'm gonna get that's that dictates what kind of paper but most of the time sadly i use really thin paper 
that's what I've been using uh, lately. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, all right, good. Um, I just think you and I have such different processes too as like we approach an image. So it's so fascinating to hear you talk about this. It's it is like you're preserving you're preserving the integrity of the paper, and so you have to be so conscious about that when you're working on those really delicate like mulberry papers or Japanese handmade papers yeah. that are just so light. Um, so that's really fascinating to hear you talk about that process. Um, I do have another question. Um, so I guess this is kind of like going to run on to um, the kind of paper selection process question that I asked yeah. earlier. But how do you display these works when you go to show them or when you go to put them up in galleries? Like, how do you approach that space um, of the kind of museum or, or gallery format? So I frame them. Um, it's not the most cost effective, um, but I do frame them. I place them in a um, kind of like a, I put a spacer so that there's a space and the paper's floating within the frame. Um, but they're always framed. Them. Let, me, let me get one and show you really quick. Yeah, that's great. So I frame them like this. Um, and you're, I'm getting the glare from the screen. But the reason I do that is because the paper is so delicate that I'm afraid for it to get handled. Even in the museum, I've had, I've had uh, some of the drawings get damaged because the paper that I work on is so, so, so thin. So um, I use, I frame them. Um, the only other thing that I've done is place plexi over the paper. Um, and aside from that, if the paper is very large, uh, like it was in my MFA, that I like a roll of paper, that there I do just let it, I hang it with two clips, these special clips that I use, um, and I let the paper just drape down. Okay, thank you. That's awesome. Um, does anybody else have any more uh, questions for Carlene? All right, okay. Um, well, I really enjoyed having you. Thank you so much for sharing your practice and wonderful artwork with us today. So let's everybody give a big thank you to Carlene. I'll give you a clap. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Sorry it was great. It was, it was nice to meet you all. And uh, I'll have, I have a PDF version of, of what I presented. So I'm going to, I guess, uh, post that. I can post that onto the chat. And if you all want to look back at it, I know, you know, I have all these really little details. And I know that it's hard to, to kind of see that. And you might be shy, you know, to tell me to stop a slide. So that way you can go back and you can look at some of the drawings slowly, or if you're interested in looking at any of the artists that I mentioned, you, know, you can have their name there and you can reference that, okay? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for All right. Me. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, feel free to post that link um, and just to our group chat. Um, otherwise, um, thank you so much and you have an amazing evening, okay? <laughs> thank you. All bye right, bye. bye.